hey, it's me, your breakfast. Now, commercials are always telling you that certain foods are a part of a well-balanced breakfast, but you know what is the most important part of this balance? While you're eating your breakfast, listening to an episode of this podcast. Before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. So, I am finally ready to announce that we have a new charity initiative here at Potterless to go through the months of February and March 2021 to try to put some good into the world, and we are calling this charity event the Raffold Prince. Haha! <laughs> Spelled normally like Raffold Prince, but Raff Fold, because that kind of almost maybe sounds like half blood. Here we go, baby! <laughs> So here's what's up. When I read the sixth book, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, for this podcast, before I knew that a major portion of this story entailed a book where someone wrote in the margins, I bought a used version of the sixth book, and I took notes in the margins. It was very funny when I realized, oh look, how relevant. I've had this book for a while, and I would like to raffle it off to one lucky listener and raise money along the way. So with the help of our Discord mod, Kevin, we have the Raffold Prince. Similar to how we did the Potterless Donation Duels, we have three charities to support in different categories, and every dollar that you donate to one of those three charities is one raffle ticket. These raffle tickets can get you different prizes. We have five winners that we'll be picking from this raffle. The top prize is my personally scribbled in Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. I'll write you a little note in the beginning of it as well to personalize it, but you'll get all my notes where I yell about Snape via scribbles and underlines and circles, etc. Second prize is similar. I scribbled in a copy of Quidditch Through the Ages. Same thing, angry notes, angry circling, all of that. I will also personalize that one for you, and that is prize number two. The third prize is a William Sonoma Harry Potter Gryffindor apron that I was gifted by someone who said, I don't have a use for this apron. Maybe you could use it for something good or give it away to someone. And here is what we're doing. I'm passing that along and giving it away for someone who needs an apron. In addition to that, you'll get an exclusive Wizard On bumper sticker and a pencil that says Wizard On. We've got a bunch of different colors. I can ask you what color you would like. Personalization! And for fourth prize and fifth prize, you will get that exclusive Wizard On bumper sticker and the Wizard On pencil. So those are the prizes. What charities are we playing for? The first charity is GLAD, which stands for GLBTQ Legal Advocates and Defenders. The second charity is Healthcare for the Homeless, Houston. And the third charity is an environmental charity called 350.org. I will be detailing these charities in depth in the intro of next week's episode, but if you want to learn more about these charities and the prizes and see pictures of all the stuff, we're putting together all of the information about the Raffold Prince at potterlesspodcast.com slash Raffold Prince. How do you enter? All you need to do is donate to one of these three charities, take a screenshot proving that you donated, and then email that screenshot to raffoldprince at gmail.com. To make our lives easier, if you could make the subject RP for Raffled Prince, then your name, the charity, and the amount given, that would help us a whole lot. But again, screenshot of your donation to prove that you donated to raffledprince at gmail.com with the subject line RP, your name, the charity, and the amount given. So that's what we've got. I'll be talking about this more in the intros throughout, but it's going to run all through February and we will end it at the end of March. I'm very excited about this. I will be matching up to $1,000 given, divided equally amongst the three charities. And again, more information at potterlesspodcast.com slash raffled prince. Also, I would like to thank the newest members of our team over at patreon.com slash potterless that are keeping the show going. So shout out to Nicole Ann Keaton, Morgan McLeod, Kelly Ferguson, Oscar Malpica, Anna Rees, Lottie Matthews, Emma Webb, Jui Yui Jurgen, Sabrina Sondegard, and the return of Milo Duncan. And of course, a huge shout out to our producer level patrons. Vicky, Christine, Aaron, Clown, Marchismo, Juan, Rosemary, Marie, Lisa, Audra, Eleanor, Nikita, Rachel, Zachary, Alex, John, Noel, Claire, Rory, Veronica, Lada, Noah, Tracy, Colleen, Jennifer, Justin, Jacob, Maya, Mark, Polly, Zena, Hardlin, Noelia, Nikki, Nikki, Kine, Amanda, Kafir, Sarah, Marta, Maya, Floor, Georgia, Skyla, Adele, Professor, Threat, Ellie, Michael, Kelly, Kerry, Connie, Jen, Nedry, Will, Marcos, Marik, Ashton, Brittany, Phelan, The Meadows Family, Ginny, Heather, Kevin, Jarl, Peter, Jan, and Callahan, Leah, Bella, Melanie, Becca, Rees, Adam, Joseph, Madison, Tonks, Sabrina, Sophia, Farzan, Melanie, Matt, Okamahime, Boney, Pony, Kelsey, Ricky, Taylor, Megan, Riley, Laurel, Erica, Miranda, Kendra, Natanya, Yogan, Darcy, Sandra, Craig, Lior, Demi, Michelle, Henrique, Casey, Megan, Sat, Jack, Sophia, Dane, Robin, Chick, Mermaid, Daddykins, Gregory, Kaka, Nina, Ribbon, Brittany, Gavin, Jack, Serenity. 
Sandy, Emily, Haley, Sabrina, Jenna, Laura, Gila, Eileen, Annette, Kirsten, Hufflepuff, Brett, Mary, Artemis, Trans People are People, Samantha, Nina, Tatiana, Taylor, Karis, Vomit Spiders, Tony, Joe, Punkfish, Wire Warrior, Catherine, Joe, Steamed Nuggets, and Can't I Potter? Who never kick off their shoes in a hallway of their apartment and then think to themselves, ah, I should probably move these, I might trip over them. And then about 15 seconds later, they trip over them. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to bonus episodes, monthly live streams, discounts on the merch store, exclusive merchandise, and more, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 164 of Potterless, the third and final episode about the first Fantastic Beasts movie, guest starring Michael Harley. Hello, Internet, and welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a 28-year-old man who never read the Harry Potter series as a kid. He read them as an adult, and then he watched movies and plays and all sorts of stuff. Some were good, some were fantastic beasts and where to find them. My name is Mike Schubert. I'm that grown man, and I'm here joined today again by Michael Harley to finish our discussion of Fantastic Beasts, the first film. Michael, how's it going? Still... Let's say still good. Yes, good. still shrug emoji. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not much has changed in the 10 minutes between recording. I'm in my home. I can work from home and I don't have COVID. So honestly, those are the base mark check marks for it's good. <laughs> <laughs> that means you're living large, living large. <laughs> so we've got the rest of this movie to discuss. I think we just get right into it and get it done. Yes, So please. where we last left our heroes, they were all trapped in a briefcase and Queenie lied about being sick again. Oh man, what a wacky situation. <laughs> so Graves then is seen in his creepy alleyway with Credence, their normal meeting location, he gives him a necklace to touch when he finds the Obscurus. So it's some communicator of sorts. I don't think you can see it in this scene that it's a Deathly Hallows symbol. Oh, can you can. You? you can in this first one. I know you can see it later you for sure. You can, and that's the problem. <laughs> what would have been the right way, one of the right ways, in my opinion, to do it, is you, you, can, you can have the necklace, fine. You can have the weird necklace that you touch and it does the thing. But have it so that Graves says everything he says and he hands Credence the necklace. Do not reveal that necklace until Credence has to touch it. Right, That's yeah. when you reveal it. But for some reason, not only has that necklace, like, is that necklace very visible in the scene. You, if you look at the bottom of the frame, you can see it. But on top of that, that necklace has already been seen when Graves is, like, playing with it in his pocket in the previous scene when they're in the jail cell. He's playing with it in his vest pocket and it's it's like poking right out so it's th this is another of the many examples of setup payoff where there could have actually been some good setup payoff here and it's just like the level of incompetence is just staggering to me with what we're doing here like this is even something that i feel is more on yates than rolling because rolling writes whatever she'll write but it's up to yates to translate that to Film language and film language yeah. would be hide the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make it so clear. Yeah. So apparently, and this is the most frustrating thing because the way the movie is set up, it's like beast in the beginning, little bit of credence, all that kind of stuff. Then it becomes way more Shaw, credence, obscurus, blah, blah, blah. And then 75% of the way into the movie, the movie remembers, oh, right, this movie is called Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. So now. The plan for Newt, because he has to do something, he is going to find the Demi guys, which is, uh, at least to his first memory, his, his first recollection, the only remaining creature out there. And the justification is, Tina says, well, you got to get all the beasts so that people can't blame you for stuff anymore. It's like the most shoehorned way to get beasts back into a movie mm -hmm. called Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. Yes. It's wild. Take this scene from that point when they're on the rooftop all the way through the point where they're on a rooftop again. <laughs> Cut everything out in between because this is just an utter, total, unrelated distraction. Mm -hmm. This actually reminds me a lot of the transition from Hallows Part 1 to Hallows Part 2. And it's a really, like, that had a lot on its shoulders. That was a difficult transition. But something that I have a problem with with that movement is... The beginning of part two, when they're at Gringotts and things are definitely a lot more lighthearted and it's still a treasure hunt movie, that is part one's. That should be in part one. Oh, yes. It is yes. a part one product. I agree. Part two should have just been the Battle of Hogwarts because then you would have time mm -hmm. to do that right. 
they really underestimated after a, a, like a, an audience that is very familiar with Lord of the Rings what they were expecting from a final battle. Like the, there was a lot more on that movie's shoulders. But it's the same thing where this whole section is a product of part one of this movie. This should have been back there if we wanted to play with the demiguys and the Akami. This is just tee fun. It doesn't do any favors to bond the four characters because I think that's what it's here for at this point is to bond them. But we had a bonding scene. We we pretty much got the bonding scene when they were having dinner together. There's not really much more we need to do with them. Like Jacob's been running around with Newt catching beasts this whole time. They're they're never going to be the trio's level of bond because they're adults. <laughs> so, <laughs> but this does nothing to further that. This is very much just let's bring the plot to a screeching halt right after we have introduced the actual mystery elements of what's important here. We just revealed everything that's important. And now anyway, let's go find that that demiguise, which is actually not that important because the real important thing we have to find is the alchemy. (laughs) Right. It's it's so strange. It it made me feel so confused because you have all of this ramp up, ramp up, ramp up of plot, and then you get this tangent and your brain wants to say, oh, wait, no, I don't want them to go away from the plot. Like, we had so much momentum. But then your brain also goes, oh, wait, I didn't want this other plot. It's not as much fun as the beast. Like, I was disappointed that they were doing the thing I wanted them to do. Like, I felt so conflicted, and it was so strange. But then once this scene starts to happen, it's fun, and you just wish it was the whole movie to begin with. Like, this could have been the whole thing. Absolutely. So they're trying to get the Demi guys. And in order to do so, Tina brings them to this guy named Narlak, who is an old informant, but he apparently loves to do anything that can make him a prophet, and creatures have been involved in that process. So they enter some sort of speakeasy. Tina and Queenie change into, like, flapper clothes, but Newt and Jacob are fine in what they were wearing, so they don't change their clothes. Newt just does his tie, and then they go in. Mm. Now, we get another fun scene where Jacob has giggle water. He tries to act really cool and macho, saying this line of, like, there's no other no match like me, and then he takes a sip of the giggle water and then lets out this absurd, like, ha! And... This is funny. Like, this is the kind of stuff the movie should have been. Like, a lighthearted, silly, more of Jacob being the comic relief. It's just too few and far between these enjoyable moments. I'm going to tease there that I have. We'll get to this near the end of the movie with what happens with Jacob. I have a proposal for how Jacob Mm. could have been restructured in the plot to make this movie better. Oh. Because I agree with you. This is a this is nice and, and humorous, and it's mostly carried off because Dan Fogler is making Jacob better than he's written. Yeah. But the part that bothers me in this scene is that Queenie, we talked a lot in the last section about Yates's weird editing and that this movie appears to have had more to it that got taken out at the last minute. And Queenie approaches the bar, looking very dejected, like she's been crying, and she's like like she makes her order and she's just sounds so sad it's weird because there's no lead up to it i was very confused i felt like i missed something yeah the last time we see her she's coming in with tina and i'm pretty sure there's a missing scene where tina and her are probably arguing about jacob and what is going to happen with him i bet yeah and it should be there because we need to develop like There were predictions by the Potter fandom that she was going to turn evil in the second movie, but there is no indication that that's going to happen. And I'm not saying you couldn't do that. What I am saying is there is not any buildup of it, and I feel like the buildup for it might be in these scenes missing from her conflict about Jacob and him being taken away from her. If you went in harder on that and made her say things that were, like have her have a conversation with Tina where she is saying things that are a bit irrational for a witch to propose Mm -hmm. about being with a muggle. You can do that, but there's none of it in here. It's just all her fawning over Jacob and the moment that they get interesting in their relationship the film cuts away from them because it doesn't care about them. Yep. So there's the... Speaking of. (laughs) Yeah, so the (laughs) next scene, right away, they cut away. It takes no time at all. We don't get any explanation. Tina reveals that she lost her horror job because she attacked Mary Lou, head of the Second Salemers. And then very soon after, Narlac comes in and he's just like the most comical mob boss goblin possible. Just over the top, he starts bartering with Newt about what you're going to get in exchange for the information. He ends up taking Pickett, Newt's little bow truckle from his jacket. 
And then Narlac apparently has tipped off Makusa and they break in and then they all have to leave. I don't know if Queenie wasn't here or if she can't read the minds <laughs> of goblins, but it feels like Queenie could have stepped in here and been like, hey, guys, he's alerting the president. Like, I feel like that could have been a useful use of her magical ability. But they have to leave uh, and they escape. Credence, then we see him finding a wand in Red Herring Girl's room. And then the mother comes in and doesn't realize that this is obviously what has happened, but <laughs> thinks it's Credence. Like, it is so painfully obvious that he found her thing. It's her room. He's by her bed. But Mary Lou is like, clearly, this is Credence's wand. <laughs> so <laughs> she snaps the wand in half and then it does the whole, like, get the belt thing ready. But then, like, every muggle villain has to do in this movie, for no reason, just says some mean stuff to Credence. And then Credence is like, well, now that you've said a mean thing about my birth mother, I'm going to go obscure us. Like, Credence's only motivation is getting shit talked to. And anytime someone does it, which all of the muggle villains do, then he turns into an obscurus and kills them. So this is exactly what happens. Kills Mary Lou. Mm-hmm. And, on, and uh, what is her name? The 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 other daughter, Ch- Ch- Chastity, Char- whatever the, her name is. She she dies too, but, you know, she had a line. So Oh, not Modesty? I didn't realize another person died. A little girl died? No, the 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 older Mary Lou's older daughter, the one with oh, the curly her. red hair. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. She, she dies. She wow. dies too, but it's not shown. Her body's shown later, <laughs> but she is not. And for some reason, I guess I, I don't know. I mean the movie forgot about her anyway. So right. it's, it's, it's just like it's forgotten about a lot of people in this plot. But yeah, that's it's it's it that's kind of the the finale of what we talked about in the last discussion that the muggles just don't pose, they can't pose enough of a threat to these characters. And so at this point, the film, like it's, it's a shame because I liked the, what the actress who played Mary Lou was doing with the role. She was a good job of creepy racist lady. Yes. She's nailing it. She makes her a distinct presence that you're kind of curious about, but ultimately there is no way to pay her off because she, she has no level of power over these over a a magical being. It just can't work that way. So out she goes. She done. And what was disappointing about her is, I agree, I think she could have been a fun villain to have. And she was fine throughout the film, but then she's not the character, or at least what has been set up, she's not the type of character to just go out of her way to say something mean to Credence. Like, no. she, it, it felt so out of character, and then that is what leads to Credence attacking her. I feel like there could have been a more creative way for her to do something that upset Credence, rather than her just be like, yeah, your mother was a worthless person. Pile of crap. <laughs> she needs to watch, or Rowling maybe needs to watch to get some sense of how to write these kinds of villains. She needs to watch Tangled and the Hunchback of Notre Dame mm. because Disney's got them manipulative, magicless characters down. Like those those two characters. You always think that Frollo and Mother Gothel have magical powers, and then you watch the movie and you're like, oh no, their magic power is manipulation. Yeah, <laughs> like, for sure. It's well done. It's well done stuff. So now the Newt crew is trying to capture the Demi guys in Macy's because we need another New York thing, apparently. Mm -hmm. So Newt, then once they get there, he's like, oh, right. I forgot about the giant fucking bird. (laughs) (laughs) I forgot about the very large bird that also escaped and is the size of a Macy's. Hey, 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 hey. To his credit. Sometimes the giant fucking bird is a really tiny fucking bird. <laughs> it's like really tiny. Like, it, like God, it's like, what do you expect him to be? Like a magic zoologist? Like, he don't know this stuff. Relax. <laughs> so he realizes that they have to find the Akami too. And the Demi guys, they realize, was babysitting it. It was looking after the Akami. Because you know how Demi guys is just babysit. Th- you remember that? That tip from Fantastic Beasts? How Demi guys is babysit things? And also they can see the future? Was mm-hmm. that in the book? Let us let us open up our original <laughs> copy of Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, which was written, by the way, by this man named Newt's Commander, who is supposedly an expert on these things. It's found in the Far East. It's an invisible beast. It's peaceful and herbivorous. It looks like a graceful ape. Its whole body is covered in long, fine, silky, silvery hair. That's it. <laughs> it babysits birds and, and can, can see, see the, the future. future. Those seem like important things to include in your textbook for students. What was also very strange about the whole seeing the future thing, because even Newt talks about it, it doesn't 
matter, right? Like it doesn't pay off. Newt's like, oh, the thing can see the future. And then the demigod sees the future. And then the future still happens? This is a (laughs) beautiful example of the ultimate failure of how Rowling writes these movies versus how she writes her books. And um, I highly recommend if your listeners aren't familiar with it. And this is from this is from my film uh, learning, my film degree. But uh, Alfred Hitchcock has a famous example of how you build suspense. And the idea is there are four people sitting at a table talking about something like baseball. And it's like a five minute conversation. It's very boring. And then all of a sudden a bomb goes off. There is no emotional payoff for that because you just have shock for like 10 seconds. You're like, I watched this really boring conversation and then a bomb went off. Hitchcock says to build suspense, you show the audience the bomb at the start of the conversation. And now the audience is invested because this conversation about baseball is not boring anymore because there's a bomb under the table. And Hitchcock's additional rule to that, though, and he even said that he failed in early movies with this, but he said, the bomb must never go off because you have now invested the audience. And if you built their tension like that and their investment in the scene, and then you still let the bomb go off, you will disappoint your audience. Dougal's vision is the bomb. And not like the bomb. <laughs> <Dot com. laughs> it is the metaphorical bomb. It is the, it is rolling trying to build tension by putting in the moment. Dougal has the ability to see what happens. Here's what's going to happen. A little ornament's going to tinkle by and that's going to set off a chain of chaos. What she did then was she still had the bomb explode. Right. I was confused when I was watching it because when it happened, I thought, First, when you see this, it's like, oh, either Dougal or Newt, somehow this information is going to get translated and they're going to stop it. And then it still happened. And I was like, did I miss something? Is the vision different? Like, what is the purpose of this? And the purpose is nothing. So (laughs) Queenie kicks this ornament. It sets off all this ridiculous shenanigans. The alchemy gets upset. It's big. It's flying around. Starts attacking. Blah, blah, blah. Newt says they have to get an insect in a teapot basically to lure the alchemy into wanting to eat an insect and then being small to go into the teapot. And it's a fine scene. It's kind of funny with Jacob getting it, but some some very confusing things happen. Well, and did you notice the thing I noticed about this scene that bothered me from most of my viewings of it? There are three magical beings in this room. Yep, yep, yep. yep. That's exactly what I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> and ain't nobody using a wand. Everybody's just like, ah, get, get the cockroach, crawl on the floor to get the cockroach. Like, but what? <laughs> right off the bat, nobody goes, uh, Accio fly. Accio, like, people yeah. could do Accio something. Then once they see cockroaches, they don't go Accio cockroach. Tina uses her hands to try to catch it. <laughs> they are able to get one. And then when Jacob throws the cockroach, Tina, who is a wizard, has this whole scene that takes like two minutes where she's the leap. going in slow motion with the teapot like, no, I'm going to, it's like, just go, oh, cool, Akio Cockroach, and put it in the teapot. Like, I get it's a movie, dramatic, blah, 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 but, like, it is so ridiculous and unnecessary. You're a wizard. Like, you're a wizard. Like, come on. I hear Ron. I hear Ron in Sorcerer's Stone being like, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you a witch or not? That's my yeah. want to start a fire. Like, it's, it's, it's that moment. And I know, because I'm sure uh, some of your listeners are savvy enough to have picked this up. There is a piece about Accio, there are a few pieces about Accio from Rolling, I think on Pottermore and in the Book of Spells that talk about how essentially you can't summon li- live things with Accio. Oh, okay. Which that gets contradicted anyway. So it's kind of a moot point because Newt in the next movie will use Accio on his Niffler. Oh, yeah. She, I think, defines in that story or the article she talks about that Accio can be used for like tiny things that are living, like inconsequential things like a flobber worm, which I would think that a cockroach would be the equivalent. Sure. This, I feel, is like her her failing on the promise of what Fantastic Beasts is. These are adults. This isn't Harry Potter anymore where these kids don't intuitively use magic. Yeah, you could see a child who hasn't been using magic their entire life forgetting just to use magic, but Tina, I don't know how long she's been it, but like she's been an auror. Like she's a detective. Uh, you should be able to remember you're a wizard. This isn't the troll scene from Sorcerer's Stone where Harry inventively sticks his nose, his, his wand up the troll's nose. 
that's something you would expect of a wizard who's not familiar with their wand. And for Ron to have this learning moment of Wingardium Leviosa that is imparted to him by Hermione, it connects all the dots really well. This, I think, is trying to be that scene. This really wants to be that scene. But when you know that there are three grown wizards who should have a very advanced knowledge of magic, and the best thing that they can do is manually grab a cockroach and a teapot <laughs> and then run... <laughs> I think I think you have failed on the promise of what this movie was supposed to be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Ridiculous. So the plan works. They get the two remaining creatures back in the case, and then everyone goes inside the case. Pickett, great moment, blows a raspberry at Newt when he puts him back. When Newt's like, oh, I, was, I definitely was going to get you back. And he's like, whatever. <laughs> great moment. Love it. Then, and I didn't realize this, and this just makes the whole decision around this character absurd is that you have the scene where Queenie reads Newt's mind after he asks her multiple times to please not do it. Then Queenie, in addition to doing the thing that he has asked her not to do, talks about the contents of his mind reading, which clearly Newt does not want to have this conversation just like incredibly rude. But then they show you the photo of Lita Lestrange. This whole conversation is about her. It's very clear that they have some sort of history. Their ex is like it's very clear that that is the connection but in the photo it is a picture of zoe kravitz so they knew from movie one that they were going to cast zoe kravitz and then kill her in the same movie like you have whatever the contract is maybe they couldn't get her in the first movie i don't know but like if you have the ability to have zoe kravitz in your film and you're like nah just one movie and we'll kill her at the end like what are you doing (laughs) what is this decision incredible actress person of color you can finally have diversity in your movies like why was she not in the first movie maybe she was filming big little lies i don't know but like come on the lita thing for me is one of the more hmm. i accept it for part one because rolling and we talked a little bit about this in the last section too about how rolling will set up a character in one book and then she'll actually introduce them like two or three books later. And I actually appreciate that level of restraint because she ensures by doing that, that she doesn't stuff her books with characters that are superfluous. Like every character has a purpose and they're really well-defined. She almost does that with Lita. Like she, Lita's set up to be that. Crimes of Grindelwald, she utterly fails that role. And, And through, again, like you were saying, no fault of Kravitz. Like Zoe Kravitz is another one of the actors. There are so many actors here who are playing in this world and trying to elevate the material past what it is. And Zoe Kravitz is definitely, for me, one of those. But I I think, too, the thing I find, in another interesting comparison between the two films that I think is just fun from a film perspective is this scene, I think, while you were saying that Queenie is outright, yes, absolutely, like, being very rude uh, to to new <laughs> for once yates is actually doing some pretty good camera work here because he is using the camera to tell the story he's using the camera to actually convey the magic the camera zooms in whenever queenie is reading his mind it just slowly uh tracks in on on newt and you never hear what he's saying and you never hear what queenie's saying to him that they're saying in like telepathically you just hear them talking and the scene conveys everything they need to say pretty well that way So it's very weird then to go to Crimes of Grindelwald and in like the opening scenes, you just hear them talking to each other in their minds. And it's the one time this series does it. And it's so weird because it's a break from the style. He lets the camera just sit and do shot reverse shot. And that to me is a great example of why I don't really care for Yates as a director and why I would like him to leave this series and get somebody new Mm. in here. Because... He can't even stay consistent with his own, like as much as Rowling's not consa- staying consistent with her rules, he's not staying consistent with his rules. And I think that is also destroying this franchise. Like, it's just a mess. <laughs> <laughs> so this conversation continues and she just keeps saying things that 
A, he already knows, and B, he doesn't want to talk about for the purposes of the audience in case you didn't get it. But just like what human and maybe she's just very socially awkward and doesn't understand how to have a conversation with other people. But she's like, you two had a history. Mm -hmm. You really liked each other. Something bad must have happened. Did she break up with you? Like, it's just (laughs) the worst conversation ever. Oh, it's so infuriating. Was this painful? How painful was it? (laughs) Tell me all about it. And I I mean, part of it does kind of feel like it's also meant to be this like benefit for Tina who is like not so nonchalantly in the background just mm-hmm. staring uh, at uh, them uh, oh I'm look, <laughs> looking at be- uh, yep, look at all these beasts in this room I'm definitely looking at the beasts <laughs> <laughs> so then we cut to Graves at the destruction of the second Salem house and very clearly we can see that the necklace is a Deathly Hallows necklace here Credence just says over and over again help me help me help me very clearly letting Graves know it's me but Graves instead is like where's the girl I need the girl and then Ezra Miller pushes all of the snot in his body out of his nose did you li- oh that- no I didn't see that well I don't know how you didn't in beautiful <laughs> high definition there's just this like glob of spit snot that just it just excretes out of his face it is just like <laughs> this is why I, it's 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 weird to me that People who like Fantastic Beasts really attach themselves to Credence. He's a whoopee. He's, he's, there's nothing, he, nothing about his life is his fault. Nothing bad that happens to him is, he's very put upon and he's just sad and pathetic and, you know, you want to protect. To me, he is what Snape apologists think Snape is. When people are like, (laughs) Snape just never learned how to love and he didn't have good parents. It's like, Snape's a grown ass man. He shouldn't be harassing (laughs) children and verbally abusing his students. Like, you don't get that excuse anymore. Credence, I don't know how old he is. I don't know if they ever reveal how old he is, but like, he's late teen, young adult. Like, Mm -hmm. he's gotten more of an excuse uh, also he's dealing with more serious stuff than oh this girl i like doesn't like me back like <laughs> i understand that love more because he's actually in a really rough situation and hasn't had anything good and like look his his home situation like you want to say snape had like a bad dad or whatever L- look at credence man look at his mom jeez mm-hmm. there's a potential depth for what credence is going through that roland kind of just skates on over because she just uses a lot of This movie is full of visual and writing tropes about all of its themes. And this is the tropiest of like abuse situations where there's there's not good writing here. There's not a deeper exploration of how these things are affecting Credence and why he is in this situation. And you're just supposed to take it for granted that these things are like as they are because Credence life bad, thus Credence angry. Yeah. And it lends to me this just Absolutely. That's why I just find it so weird that the series has decided to hone in on Credence as something important because he's just no fun to watch. Like he's just, there's barely anything to him. And he's just, why do you want to watch this character just be, just have the shit beat out of him for two hours and then just nothing fun and magical? It's just like, oh yeah, this is, this is what the magical world of Harry Potter was missing. Like, like it's just like if Harry had never left the Dursleys, but for a whole movie. <laughs> I guess JK just feels like there always has to be this brooding, complex character to follow. It's like, you could have just given us fun. Even if you're going to give us that series, to make it under Fantastic Beasts just feels wrong. If you're going to give us this deep, brooding, moody series, don't call it the Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them franchise. Write some other story. It feels like almost we were lied to. It was like false advertising because clearly they're using the guise of Fantastic Beasts as a way to just do Grindelwald backstory. So it should have just been like the Grindelwald trilogy or something. I guess like the whole reason it wasn't called that is so that the Grindelwald reveal at the end is more surprising but when you think about it these movies are barely about the beast so like the fact that newt is still here all the time just feels so forced because you made the first movie be fantastic beasts when really it's just it's just grindelwald dumbledore prequel that's all it is these movies are not like the harry potter books they did not come out rolling has talked in the past about how the reason she felt she needed to write harry potter was because She was on a train and she saw Harry so clearly in her head and the story fell into place over the years. And I, as a young 17, 18 year old 
teen when the Harry Potter series ended, I asked my mother, do you think Rowling will write more Harry Potter stories or other stories? And my mom very wisely said, you know, some people have one really good story in them to tell. Mm. The sad thing about the Rowling saga, one of the many sad things, is that I honestly think that that was true. She did have one good story that she had to tell. Fantastic Beasts was not a story that she decided to tell purely out of a need and a want and a love. It was because Warner Brothers held a gun to her head and they said, we're going to make this movie. Do you want to be a part of it? And she's like, no, I'm done with Harry Potter. And they were like, cool. Well, we can still make it because we have the rights because you gave them to us. Is that actually how it went down? I don't know about the backstory. Was it more of Warner Brothers forcing it? Like they held a gun as opposed to holding like millions of dollars oh, yeah. to her head? Warner Brothers had a plan. Their proposal was to do Fantastic Beasts more like like a nature style documentary slash Indiana Jonesy kind of adventure. That sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it was supposed to be Newt going around the world and like hunting his beasts and documenting them, which is what the book is actually about. Oh, so it was about fantastic beasts and where to find them. Wow. Yes, <laughs> yes that was the concept. Ah. And Rowling didn't want to be a part of it initially because she had really committed hard. And if you go back and watch interviews, if you can stomach it. <laughs> if you go back and watch interviews of her when Potter ended the book series, she was asked all multiple times, like, are you going to keep writing like with Harry Potter? Are you going to keep going with Harry Potter? And she was so clear. The famous one was when she was interviewed by Oprah and, and she said, I never say never, but never. It was very much like she was like, I am not completely closing that door, but I have zero passion to do this. I have other ideas in my head. She was even talking about what eventually became the Ichabog. She had revealed that by that point. Oh, and wow. so she had other plans. She was ready to move on. But I think the she made one of the best deals for an author could make with their works in history with with movie deals. But it still came back to bite her because a deal's a deal. And Warner Brothers was like, hey, this is like Star Wars level famous and we want to keep it going. So we got plans. You you on board? And she was initially, she initially said no. And they said, cool, well, we're going to do these plans without you. And she was like, but my precious characters and my notebooks of vague histories of what happened to them. <laughs> and, and thus we get Fantastic Beasts. And like you said, there are very conflicting interests there is now a mix of fan expectations that wasn't there when Harry Potter was coming out, nor was she catering to. Now she has expectations on her shoulders from multiple sides. And as she has mentioned in interviews in the past, she doesn't do well with that. That gets to her head. And we've seen the ultimate um, results of that in the last year. So that's how I think this results. So she thinks by, to tie it back to where we're at in the film, she thinks that this connection of the Dumbledores and Credence being the secret beast. Ugh. The beasts were actually the people. Oh no, the worst version of the friends we made along the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the beasts were actually the people that we barely said hello to along the way. <laughs> oh. Hey everyone, it's me, Editing Mike. I just am so distraught about the bad version of my favorite joke, the blank that we made along the way. The only way that we can recover from this sadness is to take a pause, take a little bit of a break, process this during a segment that we like to call Wingardium Adriosa. Today's episode is brought to you by another podcast that I've created, Modern Muckraker. If you enjoy podcasts that I make, but you want something a little bit different, you might enjoy Modern Muckraker. Modern Muckraker is a scripted show that I created with a wonderful team where I play the role of an investigative journalist who believes that he is completing the world's most important research, but in actuality, the questions that he is answering are things such as, when should Spider-Man take the subway instead of web swinging? This will sound like you're listening to one of those profound podcasts from reputable news sources, but inherently the questions that we are answering are very silly, but the experts that we talk to in order to answer these questions are very real. It's a fun time. The sound design is fantastic. I am very biased, but I think it's a great podcast. I think you'll think so as well. If you want to listen to it, you can search for Modern Muckraker wherever you get your podcasts, or you can go to our website, modernmuck.com. 
And now you'll hear words from a few sponsors who make it feasible for me to be a full-time podcaster. Some of these ads will be read by me, others of them won't. The ones that aren't are inserted locally, so if you live internationally, don't be surprised if you hear an ad in your country's native language. And once those ads are complete, we'll get back to this episode of Potterless. Ay, ay, ay. So Graves and Credence go to Modesty's old home that she was adopted from because I guess they know for sure that's where she's going to run away to. Mm. And Graves at this point, and again in another scene where you have villains that are set up kind of in a nice way, and then they just decide, well, now's the point where I have to shit talk Credence because this is the only thing that makes Credence turn into an Obscurus. He just goes on this really weird, uncharacteristic tangent where he says that Credence is a squib and he's unteachable and he doesn't want to deal with him anymore. And Credence says, well, you were going to help me. He's like, I have no use for you. Like, I guess Graves is so hellbent on thinking that he has found the Obscurus that he is just going to cast Credence aside and not even just ignore him, but also just insult him and put him down. He says to Credence that Mary Lou being dead is a reward enough, despite, you know, saying that he would help him and figure out his problems, blah, blah, blah. So Graves then finds modesty, but uh uh-oh, turn around. (laughs) Credence is the Obscurus, you dingus. So he just starts wrecking the place, and then Graves tries to be like, oops, sorry, man. Uh, uh, Let me hone your power, right? Let me help you. Uh, It's your old pal Graves. Of course it doesn't work. It's a a beautiful... Look at at Grindelwald just handling this situation with such flair and finesse and... (laughs) So smooth. He's so smart. He's so much better than Voldemort, guys. So, 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 so smooth. So... Credence leaves to destroy the city, I guess, but he doesn't kill Graves like he has done to every other person yeah. that has been mean to him directly. Credence Ugh. built up to be this ultimate powerful magical thing that we can't understand and has been shown to have the capability to essentially like suck the life out of people and scratch their faces, I guess is their power. Yep, that's what um, happens. You get your life sucked <laughs> out, you get a big scratch on half of your face. But he doesn't even harm this man who very clearly the film has established he would have killed on the spot. Oh, yeah. 100%. So then you have the scene where they are chasing after, trying to find Credence. He's destroying the town. And the characters just, like, show up on the roof in the right place. Yep, 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 yep. (laughs) They're just there. Uh, Graves and Tina have a vague spell battle. And this makes me think, you were saying that they don't use any advanced spells. Maybe the way that you show that this is an adult movie is everyone's just so good at magic that they don't have to say spell names anymore. (laughs) Which I know is like somewhat of a thing established in the books that nonverbal spells means you're a more advanced wizard. But that's just not how adults worked in the Harry Potter books is these adults that were still very competent wizards still use all the spells and they're still saying all the names. So... It's just vague spell galore. So they have a vague spell well, battle. Well, the, the spell battle that they have is just a visual callback to the Priory and Cantatum from 4, which ended yeah. up being used a lot in the Harry Potter series. And again, like, just talking about the technical prowess and the creativity of the Harry Potter films and how, personally, I think we peaked around, and I don't even like Order of the Phoenix. Like, it's, it's lower on my list of favorite movies and books. But... That battle at the end is peak adult wizard battle. It's what you expect. And Rowling, they pretty much filmed it the way Rowling wrote it. And nothing even close to that happens here. Like, Tina may not be Dumbledore level powerful, but she's competent. We know she's competent. And Grindelwald, as Graves, has lots of power. And he just hasn't been hiding this whole time. So why why wouldn't he just kill Tina? Like, uh, this is another one. Kill her, get her out of the way. She is absolutely useless to you. You would kill, like, he would kill her. Right. It felt like pandering to Harry Potter fans for them to have this battle that ended in the Priorian Cantatum type situation, just so that everyone in the movie could just go, oh, they did the thing. They did the thing. I remember the thing. So while this is happening, Newt is trying to talk down Credence in the subway. And of course, then Graves comes in to have a vague spell battle with Newt, and it ruins the whole thing. Another classic movie trope. Then the wizards have set up this bubble around the subway station where this is happening. 
and John Voight and a bunch of muggles have gathered around the security bubble. And then John Voight's like, yeah, take pictures because remember, I work for the newspaper. <laughs> so Tina then enters the subway. She tries to talk down Credence. It starts to work. But then as she's making progress, all the orders come in and then people are like, please don't. And then they just <laughs> shoot a bunch of light spells at him. They don't say what this is, but they all just open fire on Credence. He blows to bits, very much looks like he dies, but they don't give any sort of hint about him surviving. I don't remember what happens, and you don't have to explain it, but like, I know that he is back in the second movie, so watching this, I was like, wait, what, what, huh? Like, he very much looks like he just got fucking murdered. There's a visual hint, that, but it's bad. And it's bad because of the things I've talked about with how Yates films things. And it's Yates trying to evoke Rowling's style of selective language and, sign- and and muting culprits. It's one shot. Well, Serafina and, I, and Nude, I think, are talking after Grindelwald has left. There's a little tiny little wispy that just kind of sneaks over the brick wall. Oh. And that's supposed to be Credence. But how does he get his body back? Like, Don't ask questions. Stop asking stupid questions. <laughs> <laughs> this is all very obvious, Mike. I don't know how you're not keeping up. <laughs> so this is like, no, you're, you're totally right. This is a failing of the film. I didn't notice that shot the first time I saw the movie. I kind of figured Credence was going to be back, but I had no idea how, like it wouldn't made sense to me. Mm-hmm. This is the beginning of what Crimes of Grindelwald will set up, which is unsatisfying answers to your questions from movie one. This is like <laughs> one of the first ones, but we're about to have this like rolling set of those because of what happens next. Yeah, so after Credence explodes, Graves gives basically a Magneto speech about how wizards, muggles, blah, 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 and then he turns into Johnny Depp. And I was watching this with my wife, Kelly, and once he turns to Johnny Depp, Kelly just went, oh, Johnny Depp is so gross looking. <laughs> like to go from Colin Farrell to Johnny Depp is just like, oh man, <laughs> it's just so disappointing. I wish I could take all the credit for these, but I have to give them all to Jenny Nicholson. When you see Colin Farrell, knowing he's Grindelwald, as she put it, yeah, Dumbledore, damn, get it. <laughs> and then and then you're just like, oh, oh no, Dumbledore risked this future of the wizarding world for that? <laughs> Like that's uh, yeah. <laughs> that's and that's all I have to say about. I have spoken my piece a thousand times about yes, Johnny Depp, yes. as I know you have. Yeah, it's it's done. The more important discussion here to have is that Colin Farrell is better. Yes. Again, I don't know how it all works. We don't know enough about Graves to know like how different he's supposed to look from Grindelwald. But like maybe Colin Farrell could have just been like Colin Farrell with different hair, because the Grindelwald haircut does just look like worse. Graves hair. Maybe he just turns and he has, you know, we have bleach blonde, different color eye Colin Farrell now. Like it feels like there could have been ways to not have to do the whole different casting, but clearly I guess JK really wanted Johnny Depp in this role. I don't know. It's confusing and it just makes me sad. So Newt gets Graves tied up with the Pokeball bird again. <laughs> and then he does Revelio, which is what makes him turn into Johnny Depp. And Kelly made a very astute observation. She said, that should just be in every job interview or just, (laughs) it's a thing that you should just do every now and then at the ministry. Like, hey, important meeting. Like I was an engineer for many years and like every meeting you would start with a safety moment at the top and it would just be like, hey, here's this thing that happened in the plant. You can do this. Everyone should be aware of this going forward, blah, blah, blah. Took 30 seconds. Every meeting had to start with it. Every meeting for the commitment to safety in the wizarding world, like, hey guys, glad you're all here. Just going to do Revelio in the room to make sure no one is Satan or Hitler, whatever you want to say. Like, just real quick, just going to Revelio. Like, the fact that whatever spell Grindelwald has to be Graves is not more complicated than just someone saying Revelio is wild to me. You can have the situation that he has such this good disguise that no one was able to do it. But once you have it be thwarted by a simple Revelio, it feels so absurd and it just raises so many questions. That's why this structurally just does not sit well next to Harry Potter, because Rowling does a thorough job in Potter of explaining the faults of any magic she introduces. Like, Polyjuice Potion takes a month to brew. Once you drink it, you've got one hour. That's all you got. It's not impenetrable by spells, as far as we know, but you only have one hour. That's a great setup. That's a solid setup. That's all you need to know. And it it works beautifully for every situation she uses it in. And then 
Cursed Child comes along is like, Polyjuice Potion in every scene. Everybody's in Polyjuice Potion. <laughs> and, and Fantastic Beast has the audacity to follow that up with not Polyjuice Potion, but basically Polyjuice Potion is the solution here to this one. It's it, But like the weaker version, this is a poor version of the Mad-Eye Moody subplot from book four and yeah it's not set up there's no explanation like because people were asked if the fans were asking that after the movie was done they were saying what was that magic was it polyjuice potion was that transfigure like what did he do and then rolling badly explained she was like i think they actually traded like her and yates and Heyman all had different explanations for what happened nice <laughs> nice nice so yeah there's no continuity there's no structure we are lacking that thoughtful, thorough world building that we once had with Potter. The other thing that is confusing about it is I don't know timeline wise. I'm sure it has it somewhere. But what was the status of Grindelwald at this point? Because clearly he's not in a jail cell, so he's on the loose. I would assume people know he is evil at this point because they talk many times like Grindelwald slipped through your fingers. Like it's well known that Grindelwald is evil. If people don't know for sure, like, this dude is sitting in a cell in Nurmengard or whatever, if that's not the case, wizards around the world should be aware Grindelwald is probably pretending to be someone else. So here's what we should do all the time. It's like wearing a mask. Like, there's the <laughs> pandemic going on. Like, we all wear masks. We all should wear masks just to be safe. And you just want to keep people safe. In this Grindelwald situation, maybe the chances of him being a person are very low. But we should be revelioing all over the place just in case someone's wizard Hitler. It's the fact that they aren't on high alert for someone to be Grindelwald into skies when Grindelwald is just like on the loose like all those newspapers said where's Grindelwald people should be more worried about this there are structures in this world that we know about that should be in place everybody should be casting Revelio every day on their loved ones just to be sure it's an easy non-invasive thing to do but here we're presented with Newt being like the brilliant one who thought to do Revelio <laughs> <laughs> in a room full of Aurors and the president of Makuza who, by the way, does not whip her wand out one time during this whole movie, but especially during this scene when her oars are being literally felled at her side. <laughs> Terrible, awful, ridiculous. But now they have this situation of, oh man, like you said, we got to oblivion everybody. How are we going to do it? So Newt takes what is described as a venom, which is a weird <laughs> phrase to describe what they're doing Yeah, it'd be here, like but... if you were like, take this venom to cure the COVID. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Did you get the new Pfizer venom? <laughs> like, <laughs> what a wild thing to say. <laughs> so they, they give this venom to Frank the Thunderbird, and then he, by some unclear ability... He knows what to do. <laughs> yeah, and Newt literally says, Frank, you know what to do. Not, hey, Frank, take this vial, I guess, swallow it, and now all the rain like they don't even explain how it works but he flies up he makes the rain go and it just obliviates everyone but here's a couple of things first off the sun is out when they go outside so all these muggles just like camped out overnight they were just here all night for something they couldn't see they're like i hear noises but i wonder what's happening let's stay here till six in the morning then the rain starts going and it makes everybody start to forget but apparently you don't have to get hit by the rain because people inside who are indoors are also forgetting. Now, it shows Mr. Bingley showering and then someone else drinking water. So is it all water? But then what if you just didn't drink water or, or take a shower or get wet or like you had an umbrella? Like there's so many confusing things about this that don't make any sense. They're obliviating everyone in the city who apparently no one used a telephone to tell anyone <laughs> what's happened in this like multiple hours long thing. No one has contacted anyone. The news doesn't exist. No one's written a letter. But we even see that. We see the newspapers change. But those also get wet. So like, would they have changed if they didn't get wet? Like if there was a dry newspaper, is it fine? Like it's so unclear. But, like, the CGI is pretty cool with all of this, the bird and all that. Like, it's it's nice. It's like making up for a missing scene in part two where we were supposed to watch everybody put Hogwarts back together. Mm -hmm. It's got the sappy music. It's got the very wide shot, majestic visuals. The auras are being especially graceful in their wand movements. And it's, yeah. it's meant to be emotional. But it's, it's like, it's emotional manipulation because you're just like, I mean... 
I guess movies just have decided that, oh no, New York got hurt and now New York's fine. Like this, that subconscious thing for audiences is they're just like, oh, the thing that I've never seen in person, but I always love because it's in movies has been fixed. Hooray. And that's supposed to be our emotional closer. We have one more coming, but there's supposed to be emotion there. Everything about the film indicates it, but I'm not feeling anything. Yeah, they're playing the music in the background to make you feel it. I do think the CGI is very cool. I it think is. the way they rebuild all this stuff is cool. I did find it funny for a movie that was so heavy-handed, like New York, New York, New York, New York, New York, they're eating hot dogs, New York, New York, New York. Like, it made me so confused as to why, I, I am curious as to why they picked the Woolworth building to work in, which like is a fine building, but like you would think that a movie that is so over the top New York, New York, they'd be like, well, clearly it has to be in the Chrysler building or the Empire State building. You would think they would do something like that. And then also you have this whole scene in the city hall subway station, like Grand Central is right there. Like there's so many more more iconic subway stations you could have picked. It was just so weird that like half of the movie's like, hell yeah, over the top New York stuff. Everything is obvious. And then for this little bit, it's just like, oh, by the way, here's the obscure Woolworth building and stuff. I feel like that's because I'm a I'm a Cuaron lover. I will always give Alfonso Cuaron all my love. The thing about Prisoner of Azkaban is that he extensively took Potter out on location and you can tell. And it benefits the film dramatically. You totally rewind it with Fantastic Beasts. Almost none of that is on location. Like, none of it's in New York. Oh, yeah. It's all fake. It's all cgi And you can tell. Like, and I'm sure you can tell as somebody who lives <laughs> in New York. Like, to me, it's it's almost at the level, if you've never seen it, Baz Luhrmann's Great Gatsby, which takes place around the same time. There is not one bit of that New York that is... And he didn't mean for it to be, because Baz Luhrmann over-stylizes his visuals. He's the same guy who did... Mm-hmm. Um, Moulin uh, Rouge, right? Yeah, Moulin Rouge. So visuals are like meant to be a little off. Fantastic Beasts shouldn't be that far off, and it's not anything significant that we as audiences, like you were saying, people who are and aren't from like f- intimately familiar with New York, there's no icons that would even allow us to get attached to the city. It's just sad subway and sad Woolworth building and sad alleyway. (laughs) (laughs) That's the best they could come up with. (laughs) Now, I am getting live text messages from my wife, Kelly, who can hear me recording and talking shit about the Woolworth (laughs) building that she used to work in, saying that uh, when it was built, it was the tallest building in the world and remained so for over 15 years. And it predates the Chrysler and the Empire, which were both finished in 1930. So maybe that's the explanation for the buildings. I don't know when Grand Central was made, but I feel like maybe there could have been a more iconic thing. But yeah, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe those things weren't built until post-1920. So thank you, Kelly, for the live read fact check. So fix all the stuff, CGI, and then they do the scene, which makes me so upset is the newt crew is like oh jacob you have to get obliviated no he doesn't they have been talking about the whole movie about how it's weird and especially in oh kelly has said that grand central was 1913 so they definitely should have picked Grand Central. uh it's so weird they've been talking the whole movie about how but she's saying it's a transit hub. It, I know, <laughs> but st- they don't actually take the credence. Doesn't actually take the subway, Kelly. <laughs> He's just brooding in there. Anyway, I got to finish this episode, Kelly. Stop texting me. Uh, <laughs> so they've been setting up this thing throughout the movie where Newt's like, "Oh, that's weird. Like sometimes wizards marry muggles over in the UK. Like how come you guys don't do it?" So it's a very clear setup of they don't have to do this. It probably is more advantageous for Jacob to continue as a character that makes sense in the future movies if they're like, yeah, we're going to make him rogue. It's very much this setup of like, ah, they're going to take him with them. They'll go back to London. J.K. Rowling's already revealed that each movie is taking place in a different city. This is perfect. He doesn't have to stay in America anymore. He doesn't have any sort of life. They don't show him with any sort of family. He lives in a one-bedroom apartment by himself. He clearly has no ties to anything. He has a job that he hates. He hasn't even started a bakery. The next movie is in France. Why don't you just not obliviate him, go to France, open a patisserie, boom. Like, it's not that hard. But they decide, like, you've got to walk in the rain. you got to get obliviated. Queenie's got to come out objectively with a pretty cool, like, magical clear (laughs) umbrella thing from her wand. Like, that's actually really clever. She comes out. Then you've got Newt finally putting a string around his damn briefcase (laughs) so it doesn't open and create every plot point in this film. 
And then this is the thing that I recently made fun of on Instagram where he and Tina have this very weird and awkward conversation where Tina is like, oh, yeah, I'll check out your manuscript. And like they very clearly like each other. But Newt is just awkward. But like he is an awkward person. So it kind of makes sense. But she's like, oh, I'll look out for your book. And he's like, yeah, can I send you a copy? And she's like, sure, go for it. Of course, she does the thing where she's like, fantastic beasts and where to find them. (laughs) Hold for applause. So the entire audience can be like, she said the thing. Uh, and then he's like oh i'd like to actually give you your copy in person and she's like i'd like that and then she just blurts out like does lena was strange like to read i was in fact listening to your private conversation that you didn't want to (laughs) have the weird thing about this scene is that for potter fans this is why i just don't know who these films are even for because if you read Fantastic Beasts, there ain't no mystery about what's going to happen to Tina and Newt. They get married. They are happily wed by the time that he writes the book. It's in the about the author. Yeah, there is no tension to that. So I don't know why they're even playing around with that, which is funny because here I am asking about that at the end of this movie. And then the next movie is like obsessed with playing with that dynamic and just trying to just jam in wrenches into their plot that were not needed. And I, the, the funny thing is that this time I watched, all I could notice was just everybody's like on the boat and like <laughs> the ship staff are like waiting for Newt to get on the boat. And I'm like, they're gonna, they're gonna leave without you. You gotta get on the boat. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, it is such a long conversation. And for every New York based transit thing I've had, like subways, they don't wait for you at all. But at least like the actual trains that you take, like a train train, those are manned by people and people decide when to go. But like, a normal person, especially in the stereotypical New York that they have established here, like that guy after five seconds would have been like, hey, buddy, get on the <laughs> fucking boat. What are you doing? There's like 50 people waiting. To- Shut the fuck up. Like there is no world, no. no world in which they have this very long, needless conversation where she says, does Lita Lestrange like to read? I screamed. Well, then you could call her Rita Lestrange. Oh, <laughs> Newt says some vague like, oh, I don't know. We were, we're not close, like setting up like I could still get with you. Don't worry. It's not a big deal. Oh, I got to catch this boat now. And then he just goes on the boat. That should have been the ending. Like, the, <laughs> but this movie just mercifully will not let you go. It's like Lord of the Rings, <laughs> the final one, where it's like, here's the 13th ending. <laughs> so we get the next ending where Jacob opens a bakery shop. This also could be the ending, but like, he's got this place. It does just say Kowalski on the banner, which is a strange <laughs> choice. Like, there's a truck outside that says Kowalski's Fine Foods or Fine Baked Goods or whatever. But the fact that the banner and the thing on the front of the store just says Kowalski, very weird. Like, you could add bakery or food or Fantastic. something. Fantastic yeasts and where to find them. (laughs) (laughs) Fuck! (laughs) Missed opportunities. (laughs) Damn. (laughs) Fuck, that's good. Oh, man. I fixed the whole movie. Yeah, then in the second one, he opens a meat place and it's the brines of Grindelwald. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so yeah, so they have this bakery. And what I actually think this is pretty clever. Like, all the Jacob stuff is great. In a clever way, they have somehow set up that he is not fully obliviated because all of the baked goods are in the shapes of the Fantastic Beasts. You've got little Niffler-looking things and little Dougal-looking things and all this stuff. It's cute. It's clever. And you have an actually fun reveal where a customer says, how do you come up with this stuff? And he goes, I don't know. It just kind of comes to my head. So, like, that's clever and creative. This also could have been the ending. But now Queenie walks in. And here's the thing that makes no sense about this. When you show the bakery, there's a line out the door. There's tons of people in the store. Queenie walks in and has this moment with Jacob. Everyone's fucking gone. No one's there. But there are still, and you can see in the window, there's still a line of people outside. But I don't know if Queenie used magic or something, but everyone has decided, we're going to let this woman have a private moment with the baker. (laughs) It's the last gasp of weird things that may have gotten eliminated or things that could have easily been done better. You can build up that reveal in that scene. You have Queenie walking up to the store. You have her take out her wand and subtly kind of push people out of the way. Sure. It's easily done. Now, because I promised it, I did say I had a fix for Jacob. Okay. My fix is you actually make Jacob the viewpoint of the movie. Yeah. Because this movie has no viewpoint. This movie uh, scatters itself everywhere. And what that already sets it from uh, apart from Harry Potter 
because Harry is our viewpoint and he is really strictly our viewpoint unless there is some really important information that the reader has to see out of his perspective. Otherwise, we never break. Right. I think this movie would work much better if you center it on Jacob Rather than put him in just the very tropey, like, oh, he's in a menial job that he doesn't like, put him in a menial job in the newspaper working for the Shahs. Oh, that would have been real. Oh, my. <laughs> wow. Holy crap. You've already made a way better film. Mm-hmm. My gosh. He's an up and coming reporter. He wants to be an investigative reporter in the same way Tina wants to be an investigative or yeah. get rid of the Shah brother who's like, witches are among us. Have him be that character. Right. Yeah. Jacob replaces him. And then you actually have a reason to hate the Shahs besides they said really mean things to Credence in a five second span. Wow. The line that got me to that was when Jacob, when they're sitting in the jail cell at the minute at Makuza and Jacob says, the obscure will kill the shot. You're done me a kid killer. <laughs> that struck me because I realized, well, the reason Jacob even knows who the Shahs are is because they're political. They have political power and they control the newspapers. Yeah. Why doesn't he just work there? So yeah, have him work there. Have him trying to cover the witch's story through Mary Lou because he he sees her around town. That then puts him in the same place as Tina and Newt. And it makes more sense for him to come across this stuff if he starts noticing all this wizard stuff rather than just like, oh, I happen to be at the bank the exact same moment that Newt's commander did this thing. That'd be way better. And then then it would probably lend more credence eh, uh. to him not getting obliviated and him becoming a more important character in the second one because now the intrigue is like, how does he blend in? Gosh, wow, you fixed the whole franchise. The, yeah, you, you're totally right. Like the motivation at the end would be, I feel even deeper because he would have proper character conflict. His career depended on him getting the story. He got it but he doesn't want to sacrifice that he just made these amazing friends because you could still keep the aspect too that he's lonely. He doesn't have anything but his job. Right. So now he has a conflict and that gives Pickery more of a reason to insist that he be obliviated because that he just can't be trusted because he's in the news. He doesn't want to be, but he understands. Wow. That brings much more of an emotional gut punch to the end. Yeah. And it, like you said, brings much more interest into him possibly rediscovering this world and realizing what happened to him. Although, honestly, the other piece about this, too, is this movie is a tightly closed circuit. There are no questions in here that are interesting enough to ask for a sequel. But apparently, what's up with Credence is enough (laughs) to make the second one. So that's the end of the movie. I mean, the movie just ends with, like, Queenie and Jacob exchanging a look, and then that's it. But that is the end of... The movie, the end of this episode. So, Michael, thank you so much for coming on, lending your expertise, having some really good conversations beyond just like critical of JK, but also just like critical of the movie. The film knowledge perspective really came through. So thank you so much for all of that. This has been wonderful. I love another critic of favorite of mine, Lindsay Ellis, who you, you some of you may know. She's pretty popular these days. She she has said before that people sometimes say with movies like these. Don't you ever just turn your brain off and just enjoy the movie? And her argument, which is very much mine, is no, I don't want to turn my brain off. I'm using it. (laughs) And that is, I never turn my brain off during movies, even movies that you would define as guilty pleasure. There's always something to think about. There's always a reason that media gets made when it does. Harry Potter had many reasons for its existence. Even in its strange little cul-de-sac, Fantastic Beasts, has reasons for why it is the way it is. Yeah, and it could have been fun. I feel like it could have been similar in a way to like how John Wick works, where the John Wick franchise, like it is just fun and you still have like some lore building stuff in it. It's vague enough where you don't get too questionable about it. And it's still fun that like if they do something that doesn't make sense, like could he really have killed that guy in that creative way? Probably not. But like we're going to give that a pass because everything else is good. I feel like Fantastic Beasts could have like found its nature there, but it doesn't and it didn't. And oh boy, I can't wait to do Crimes of Grindelwald. So Michael, thanks again for joining. If people want to find you doing stuff, uh, where can they do so? They can find me on Twitter at Lupin Patronus. You all know how to spell it because you're the you're the hardcore fans. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't, no underscores, no anything like that. That's just been my name all this time. I definitely am always looking to engage in thoughtful discussion with Potter fans because I do not consider myself some kind of be all end all knowledge bank. And, and even less so these days when I am in my master's program filtering out that conmarrying my brain 
of Harry Potter <laughs> trivia so that I can fit library trivia in there. But I just love to encounter other fans, learn from y'all, get your perspectives on what's going on. I always try to present my thoughts on what's going on with Potter. And I think even with my my newfound relationship with Potter, how I how I will move forward with less of it in my life, I will always be intrigued and and keeping up with the Potter news as somebody from that phenomenal generational experience. And so I I certainly thank you for keeping this up the way you have. And just I, I would I we've already talked about possibilities of my return and I would yes, be happy yes, to yes. anytime. Definitely. That'd be fantastic. Well thanks again, listeners, thanks for listening. And as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter before they chomp down on a niffler croissant, <laughs> wizard on <laughs> Hey, if getting here means you've caught up on Potterless, but you need more Potterless audio, why don't you check out our Patreon? From director's commentary to bonus episodes, we've got so much wonderful content that you can listen to. And if you join today, you get access to the entire back catalog. I've been making Patreon content for four years. So there's a whole Trevor trove of stuff all available to you at patreon.com slash Potterless. Potterless was created by Mike Schubert. It is hosted by Mike Schubert. It is edited by Mike Schubert. It is produced by Mike Schubert as well as Vicky Garcia, Christine, Aaron Johnson, Klaus Lopu, Marchismo, Juan Sanfilio, Rosemary, Dajmari, Lisa C. Keen, Audra, Eleanor Curlin, Nikita Power, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Alex Consolver, John Cocker, Noel Basile, Claire Spencer, Rory Collier, Veronica Bartova, Lada Bartova, Noah, Tracy Toya, Colleen, Jennifer Marklu, Justin Montero, Jacob Parrish, Maya Gray, Mark Body, Polly Burge, Zena Rosnowski, Harlan Haskins, Noelia, Nikki Harris, Kine, Amanda Alfred, Kafir Shaltiel, Sarah Shedder, Marta Morrison, Maya Flor Sake, Georgia Davis, Skyla Lilly, Adele Ryan, Professor Threat, Ellie Hoskovchova, Michael David Yordi, Kelly Otilio, Kerry Crumpler, Connie Binkowski, Jen Went, Nedry OS, Will Huser, Marco Cepeda, Marie Rieger, Ashton Gabrielson, Brittany Gutierrez, is Phelan, the Meadows family, Ginny from the block, Heather Langeal, Kevin Stewart, Jarls Fiven, Peter McGrath, Jan and Rose Dab, Callahan and Deris, Leah Reed, Bella Barlack, Melanie Demi, Becca Spry, Reese Dignan, Adam Graham, Joseph Torp, Madison, don't call me Nymphadora, Sabrina Balsiger, Sophia Loves Pigs, Farzan Jarabat, Melanie De Grave, Matt Barger, Okamahime, Bony Pony, Kelsey Gillespie, Rike Mangor Jensen, Taylor Payne, Megan Moon, Riley Kitas, Laurel Happy, Erica Butler, Miranda, Kendra Hertz, Natanya Page, Yogan Shanley, Darcy Alexandra Harrison, Sandra Rose, Craig McRoberts, Leor Nachum, Demi Lynn, Michelle Spurgeon, Henrika Wolf, Casey Canales, Magan Stempen, and Zot, Jack Gitzes, Sophia Leone, Dane Nemcher, Robin Garcia, Chick Parr, Mermaid and her Daddykins, Gregory Hughes, Caw Caw, Mother Feathers, Nina Jazalik, Ribbon Monstrosity, Brittany Harper, Gavin Miller, Jack Parr, Serenity Allen, Emily Quinlan, Haley Hastings, Sabrina Casanova, Jenny Browers, Laura, Hila, Eileen Gazesh, Annette Pipitone, Kirsten R. Cunningham, Hufflepuff alumni, Brett Clausen, Mary Price, Artemis, Trans People or People, Samantha McNamara, Nina Campley, Tatiana Schmitova, Taylor Roberts, Karis Davies, Little Vomit Spiders Running Around, Tony Joe McHufflepuff, Punk Fish, Wire Warrior 4976, Catherine Carol Chack, Joe Sander, Hunter Fincham, Steamed Nuggets and can't I Potter? Web designed by Kelly Schubert and the music is by Bettina Campamanis. If you want to find us on social media, you can at facebook.com slash Potterless, twitter.com slash Potterless pod, instagram.com slash Potterless podcast, and reddit.com slash r slash Potterless. For any and all information about the show, you can go to Potterlesspodcast.com. For bonus content, you can go to patreon.com slash Potterless. And for merch, you can go to Potterlesspodcast.com slash merch. If you want to tell someone about the show, you think of someone who would like it, reach out to them directly or post about it on social media or leave a rating and review. All of those things help. Thanks again so much for listening, and until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, wizard on!